Here we go. Video cast and podcast for the week ending December 30th, 2018. This is the last show of the year. It is episode 297, where we talk about all things smart controls, all things smart, and of course to bring in the in the in the in this year and bring in the new year, we got the man, the myth, the legend, the one, the only, Mark Peacock, and the man, the myth, the legend, the one, the only, Kenny Smyers. We got two great folks to bring the year in. Boys, welcome to the show. Hey, good to be with you, Eric and Ken. I uh, can't believe this is the end of 2018. And you know what I was just thinking, guys? Uh, curious. Uh, I was looking back at some archives uh, about control trends and in preparation for the control trend awards coming up uh, next month. And it dawned on me, control trends is celebrating 10 years old 2018 are you kidding me uh, just 10 years where has the time gone gents that's for sure it has been 10 years so we're going into our 11th year and uh what a partnership that uh, kenny and i have here uh we kind of so, go way back and yeah go ahead i was gonna say so you know i i know the story but i doubt that several of the listeners know the story how did you guys first meet and how did you come up with this whole concept of control trends and what made you make that leap and a leap of faith, I guess, is truly what it is to uh, start this whole thing? Well, I, it sort of started with me, Marcus. I uh, would always walk through our sales office and people would be trying to explain to other people, you know, no, this thing's on the back of the thermostat. That's where the part number is. And I'd hear the same things over and over again. So I kept going, somebody should just do a video of it so that we could send them a link to the video and we could show them versus having to explain it every time. And after about the hundredth time of doing this, I got really upset and I went and bought a video camera. And so now I got this video camera and, and I'm, I'm starting to shoot the videos and well, what do I do with them? I figure I could put them on YouTube. But then the best use of the video came in because I had salespeople always, always coming in to talk to me about wanting to do product demos. And so I just said, wow. I'll just take a video of them doing the product demo and then I can show my team. And then after that, I said, well, then I could put it up on, I could put it up on YouTube. And then out of that was sort of born the website. Okay. So fat, go back a couple years before that. I'm in a Johnson controls meeting, sitting next to this guy who introduces himself as the man, the myth, the legend. And, no, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and he and I, he and I get to talking to this Johnson meeting and, uh, he kind of goes, well, you know, I'm, I'm do, I do controls, but I'm also a writer. One day I'm going to be a famous writer. And I said, well, that's interesting because I do controls, and one day I'm going to be a famous painter because I was painting at the time. And uh, out of that, uh, friendship sort of born around art sort of came up. And, you know, I would see Kenny at meetings, or we'd get back and forth. He'd show me what he was writing or send it to me, and I would send him some pictures of my paintings. And, and we had these great discussions about art. So fast forward, and Kenny, I'll let you pick the story up, because a couple years later, I think it was 2010, uh, I see Kenny at a Tritium, Tritium meeting, and that was sort of the fatal thing. Mark, you were actually running that meeting, so Kenny, I didn't show up for one of the sessions because... <laughs> <laughs> we played hooky. Okay, I remember this now. And, it, and to Eric's point, um, we were in this fabulous resort in Arizona or somewhere, and and we we were early risers. I, I remember I, I always like to get coffee and go to the lobby and read and get out of the room. And, and uh, I see this guy over there and he's stenciling or sketching something. And he's you know just kind of looking at stuff. And we started a conversation. And if you remember, the book, Eric, was Sir Joshua Reynolds. That's and right. it was, uh, he created the Art Institute and, and, and the, uh, the thing in London. And he told the uh, king at the time, he said, if we want to ever catch up to the Italians or maintain pace 
with the Dutch and the Italian artists, we need to start an institute and get it rolling. And so he had created this art institute. And uh, it was a heck of a book, but it, it was about the, the fundamentals of, of, of getting good at something. And, you know, really you dig it and you learn from all the experts. You go through mentorships and then you go through the academies and then you start your own branch of whatever it is. And, uh, you know, I think I must have stuck with us because, uh, we did play hockey at a meeting. We were, we were. Uh, I was going to the meeting, and I, I remember I had my notepad, and I was all set, you know, trying to find the room or wherever it was. And Eric says, "Hey, he goes, uh, forget the meeting. I want to talk to you. Uh, I'll get you a drink. We'll go sit by the pool and talk." I said, well, "Okay, nice. All that was it. Do, all you have to do is offer Kenny a drink, and he will definitely uh, <laughs> sidetrack me." Yeah. Meeting, yeah. Well, and then what it was is uh, the way I remember it. <laughs> excuse me, was that. Um, Eric had started to put his uh, his time and effort and energies, his creative energies into the the uh, Control Trend site, and he needed content. and And the best way to get content is to get you know ask other people to get involved. So, we created a scenario that would have immediately involve uh, my, my myself and my participation. And we were writing under uh, pen names, and then um, Eric started the secret handshake thing, and that was the first time I saw the power of the internet. In other words, to me, it was kind of spacey mm -hmm. and, you know, let's, you know, sure, you know, social media, blah, blah, blah. But uh, Eric started this thing where every distributor would have a secret handshake. We had to make up a story about how we had some sort of a secret handshake between distributors uh, and within our, our, our business world that, you know, gave us credit and, 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 you know, it was like, you know, some sort of, it was, it was all manufactured, it was all science fiction, but uh, it was a lot of fun. And that I think got, got it all started. I remember first time I saw my name on the control trends thing there and I said, dang. This is fun. We're going to keep this rolling. So, All right. And, and out of that, sort of the Control Trends Awards was born because what happened once we created the Control Trends site is it's just difficult to get content. So little, little do people know that the original Control Trends Awards was going to be all sort of smoke and mirrors. It was going to be, I was going to actually film the whole thing uh, in, our, in, in our studio at our office. We're using a green screen and pictures of people clapping and stuff like that. And because uh, I was trying to get vendors to put up content, to give me some content to put up. So I figured, well, if you were nominated, Mark, from Linkspring, hey, you know, come on, come on Control Talk now or send us some stuff we can post on the website. So maybe your product wins. We were still going to count the votes and everything. But then what we were going to do was uh, we were, we were going to say, OK, and the winner is Linkspring. Oh, accepting the award for Linkspring today, we'd have one of our warehouse people come up and do it or mm -hmm. something like that. And I'd have the fake people from Hollywood clapping and all that stuff. So I had this whole thing orchestrated in my head. And Kenny said, you know what? I think people might be willing to sponsor. Before you go too far with that, we should reach out and see if people were interested. And lo and behold, people were. So we had sponsors. And that was where the first Control Trends Awards took place in Dallas as a real award show. Mm -hmm. But originally it was set up uh, as a way to generate content for the Control Trends site. Wow, it was a it was a real though meritorious uh, you know effort that we we thought was important. Somebody had just recently retired, uh, and they had spent uh, over thirty years, thirty plus years. Warner Buck, Warner Buck, and 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 he was just it was just like you know he just disappeared off the stage. Nobody knew what happened to him, where he went. Nobody he wasn't recognized. You know how, how he he changed the industry. So Eric and I started thinking, you know what, we've got to get some kind of a tool, some kind of recognition. Plus, we were just in the in the very beginning of awareness how our industry had no parity with the other professions. And, and we needed to do something to bring a whole lot of limelight and a whole lot of attention to some of the incredible people. I remember one time uh, a guy we were talking to about this, he said that my kids still don't know what I do for a living. I go to work in the morning, I come back home at night, uh, we live in a beautiful house. They get, you know, we're doing all well economically and socially, but nobody really knows what I do for a living. What is a sales engineer? And we said that was it. So that was it. We had to do it. So even though it was our intentions originally was to generate content, we very quickly realized that our industry needed some. As a matter of fact, Kenny, I found a clip, uh, the original clip promoting the Control Trends Award. So I'll roll that real quick and people can take a look at this we're going way back. Hollywood has the Academy Awards. The music industry has the Grammys. Baseball has the All-Stars, Pro Football has the Hall of Fame. Virtually any group of professionals has a way of honoring their superstars. That is except for the HVAC industry. My name's Eric Stromquist, and with your help, I'd like to change that. What we're proposing is the first annual Control Trends Awards. These awards are designed to acknowledge 
the people and the companies that make our industry great. So think about it. At one point in time, there were no Oscars. There were no Grammys. There were no All-Pros. And there were no All-Stars. They only came about because a group of people got together and decided it's time for us to acknowledge the superstars in our industries. So please join me and Control Trends and let's acknowledge the superstars of the HVAC industry. Cool. So, so now that it's, you guys uh, have a relationship that's 10 years old, think, we're all married. What is that 10-year anniversary gift that you have to give your wife so you've got to give each other's, uh, you know, I mean, so you got to think th of this gift that you got to give each other now that you're celebrating 10 years together. Well, hang on. I got to ask Kenny this. My wife hates control trends. I mean, she is, she's accused me <laughs> of loving Kenny more than I love her because obviously Kenny, I have to cut this on the weekends, right? It's a lot of work. It's a labor of love. So my wife has been no, not, none too supportive. So she would probably say, you need to give me a 10 year gift for putting up with you and Kenny. <laughs> uh, I, th I think that, that, that actually sounds best. That, well, Eric, can I give you the 10th yeah. year anniversary gift. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, what is the appropriate? It, it has to do with uh, traditionally it's associated with gifts of tin or aluminum, but there's nothing wrong with breaking tradition with a gift that's best commemorated of true love. All right, affordable, Kenny, there you go. Okay, elegance can, can, and can, personal can, can, creation. Kenny, check, check your office. I'm going to send you 10 rolls of aluminum foil, buddy. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. So they get more expensive around the, you know, the 20th year and the 30th year. You start going from uh, tin to gold to uh, diamond and all that other stuff. Yeah. So, so the last one last question is so here how you guys got started. And you mentioned folks retiring and things. And, you know, part of the Control Trend Awards have been, um, you know, the Hall of Fame Award and things like that. So, one of the ideas that myself and uh, Paul Oswald, who used to be a formidable force in the industry, and we all know him from uh, ESI days and one of the truly great master system integrators, uh, came up many years ago that we should uh, create a what we call a crodgy old men controls home in Florida, in which we take all of our tech, not all the our best technology, we make it a smart place. And then people like us, when we're ready to go out to pasture or whatever, we would all retire there and just uh, enjoy the rest of our lives. So there you go. let's make that part of the whole control trends movement. Right. And of course, we would know how to override the thermostats if we were too hot or too cold. Or override right. The exactly. And exactly. Of course, and of course, Paul Oswald is one of our Hall of Fame members. So uh, yeah. So anyway, so that could be the next step in, in this progression of the, the control trends movement. Well, listen, Marcus, uh, we're hoping, uh, you know, sort of the purpose of this show is to sort of review 2018 and then sort of uh, speculate on what we might see in 2019. So from your perspective, what were some of the trends you saw in 2018? Well, first, you know, having been in this business for many years now, I thought 2018 was by far the best year that our industry has gone through for lots of different reasons. Obviously, the continued advancement of super technology by you know, the vendor and the OEM and technology provider communities, the coming of age, if you will, of uh, a lot of talk in and around the master system integrators. And other things such as the, the, the conversation changing as well. Uh, you know, it used to be back in the day, we talked about connectivity and integration and, you know, and automation. You know, today, all of those are, are part of the conversation, but we've added a lot more things to it. You know, a lot of the conversation today is we're talking about space utilization, uh, productivity, wellness, the occupant experience, as an example. We've gone from clipboards to tablets and phones to manage the buildings. And so I think the big thing for me is not only the advancement of technology and the acceptance by the built community, the building owners and operators, but also that conversation, uh, how it's changed and how it's progressed. 
That's a lot to unpack there, Marcus. Kenny, you want to take the first stab? Those are great, great. I, I, I agree completely, but I think we got to talk about them some more. Kenny, you want to take the first stab at some of the stuff Mark was talking about? Well, sure. The, the first one I, I like is the, um, and I agree, that um, the the way we've seen things happen, uh, you know, there's always barriers of entry. There's always, uh, you know, footprints. There's always costs. You know, there's always things. I think this is the first year that I've, I've you know, experienced in the industry where all those barriers were pretty well dealt with. There was no reason that you could not get first stepped uh, and create a modular approach towards any of the aspects that we talk about in the smart connected intelligent building. To, to Marcus's point, there's been you know uh, a tremendous um, reduction in upfront costs for, for very formidable uh, building control, building automation. I mean, uh, you know, when you think about Ported Niagara, when you think about the the incredible small I/O smart devices that now are available. Um, so now, basically, it's it was shifted from uh, our style where we've needed to make these uh, first steps had to be f- so formidable. You know, the investments you needed so much money and so much whatever. Now you need a creative marketing uh, approach to deliver solutions. So I agree uh, with everything you said, Marcus. Well, and, and I want to sort of chime in on that because I think the marketing is key. You know, many times this year, Kenny and I have repeated that uh, if you don't have a great product, you're not in the game. If you don't have great service, you're not in the game. Uh, so it really gets down to the differentiator is how stuff is presented because I think more so than ever, we've seen so many choices for owners. So how can you make it simple for them so that they can choose? So I think the message has become as equally as important as the product. Agree or disagree, boys? Oh sure, sure. I think I think that, yeah. and, you know the 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 it's been like a, a realistic surrendering of proprietary uh, you know obstacles. You know the 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 thing. I think there's still some players out there that insist on my way or the highway or I want it all uh, in in terms of you know how they handle uh, you know large portfolios and and, and you know, distributed environments with with building automation. But I think it's the first time I've seen multiple vendors understand what the what the users want you know and i think the educational uh, shows that we've been to and, and the, some of the big you know meetings with like a real com you know project haystack you know haystack connections you know all these industry events the summits that have gone on and and the educational uh process to the user where the user truly now can uh, inter- interface in our business intelligently uh, they're up to speed. They know what they want. They know what they need, and they know they're not going to take, you know, the round peg for the square fit anymore. You know, it's just not just not going to happen. So I think you know this was the first year where I've actually found you know, <coughs> excuse me, less of a um, less of a uh, story that we couldn't honestly believe ourselves. Remember back we used to sell you know ten years ago to that point we said we had uh, you know open systems and we didn't. You know we we had uh, you know proprietary, uh, you know, backnet that had, you know, you can make it proprietary law and same thing. So, <laughs> excuse me guys. Um, but, but, you know, this was, was the first year where I, I did not feel any kind of remorse in saying that we have a truly open system. And if you guys can get backnet, uh, uh, you know, available to us, whatever, whatever, whatever you have, whatever legacy system you have or whatever you want to put in for the future, you can make a future proof. So. Right. Well, I think Kenny's totally on it with the, uh, the owners being more educated. I think the other thing with the messaging, sort of tagging onto the messaging, <clears throat> is that uh, now it's not just about the product. When you're talking about it, I mean, I think Ken Sinclair sort of began to talk about the humanization of the building, the symbiotic relationship between the building and the control system. And I think that has got to become part of your messaging. You have to have those conversations where, you know, we've talked about the three thirty three hundred dollars rule. Uh, and for those of listeners who might not know what that is, is, is uh, basically $300 per square foot goes into the employees. So if you can make them more productive, that's what the owners are paying attention to, Kenny. So you have to bring that into sort of your marketing and your conversation. I'm sorry, Mark, I, I stepped on you there. So yeah, and, yeah, and I think too is that as an industry, we are progressing a lot. We're hearing the owners and the building operators, first of all, and I think that's truly important to hear what they have to say. And then again, it's not just about integration anymore. Don't get me wrong. It's truly, absolutely part of the solution, but it is truly driving measurable business outcomes. And to your point, making an employee more productive or reducing uh, the time an employee is sick due to 
uh, the office environment, you know, wrong type of temperature or this, that, and the other. And I mean, all these studies now have come out uh, and are starting to show that. And, and it actually means dollars to the bottom line of an, of an organization where we did not have these types of discussions even three to five years ago. I'm sure. No, we, no, we didn't. And I think the other thing that goes along with this is the fact that the owners, I mean, not owners, well, the owners are aware of this. But if you own a business, just getting the millennials to come to work, you better have a cool environment and they better have controls. I like, remember Comfy, Kenny with uh, Lindsey Baker, that, that product where the, 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 the tenants feel like they're part of that sort of ecosystem, that environment where they have the ability to have control over their environment. Well, I mean, that's a beautiful act. I mean, let's just stop there for a second and, and, talk, and talk about that. Because again, when you talk about marketing messaging, you talk about uh, the first times where we, we really, you know, had this total uh, transparency into the system. I think that's another word that, you know, fits into it. Now our, our systems are transparent. But imagine when we used to sell placebic thermostats. Do you remember guys? How And, you know, it was like kind of a joke, you know, uh, it wasn't a joke, but we we put in range stops so they couldn't, you know, the, the user couldn't dial or move the set point beyond this or uh, beyond this. Uh, we put in, uh, you know, remember the first features we had in the software was <laughs> they can move the thermostat up and down all they wanted, but they were going to get two points this way or two point, or, you know, two degrees this way. And and imagine now that you know that just so that's so reversed, you know, three you know, 180 degrees uh, in the other direction where we now have comfy where all the placebic aspects uh, that were basically you know, misleading the users because it was all about saving energy. And I don't care what those tenants think. We're not going to turn that air conditioner past, you know, you know, 68, or we're not going to turn the heating past 72 period. You know? Um, so to make a long story short, I mean, I mean, remember the days where they used to tell, bring a sweater to work or tell your kids to have a sweater in their locker because we're not going to turn the heat up past, you know, whatever degrees. And we've seen this just in complete reversal. And I think what the, the Comfy, uh, what it did was it put a connection to the people so they felt, um, you know, tied that they, if they needed 10 minutes of heating or 10 minutes of cooling, got that reaction, they wind up turning up to be the most energy conscious people in the world because as soon as they're happy, they'd say, I'm comfy, and it shut down the, you know, the, the, uh, the tempered air coming into their zone. And then, it, and then we realized the metrics that became involved was we finally had an honest zone system that knew where everyone was precisely because their smart device contacted you know, or made them aware in, our, in, in terms of monitoring where the people were. So you really know when people came to work, while they were at work, where they went. And now all of a sudden you have all this data that became you know, manifested in, in, and could really make those dollars available. But I think one of the most important things that uh, came around and you talk about Paul Oswald, I remember this um, Ken St. Clair show, uh, Mark, you were on the board, their panel. And the metrics, we finally got metrics that mm -hmm. proved uh, the, you know, the point all the way to the lighting metric where now it's very typical. You have eight scenarios for a typical school day where the kids come in all energetic and whatever. You got to calm them down right before lunch. You got to speed them up, you know, or not really speed them up in terms of chemically, but in terms of, uh, you know, the physiologically, you know, where the, the lighting can be so influential in terms of adjusting the behavior and adjusting the attitudes. And now we see this going all the way into the circadian rhythms where instead of just chickens producing eggs every 20 hours instead of every 24 hours because we fool them with the light and darkness, uh, and then you have your growth facilities for the marijuana industry. Now we see that we're putting these lighting, these knowledgeable algorithms into play to have people recover from operations and, and, and very serious medical uh, issues because we're so tied to our environment. So once we put all that into play, then we set a whole new business at large, you know, where people can actually mine mine that that, that potential data, uh, you know, and then and wow. Yeah, and I think to your point about data, that truly I think was revolutionary for 2018. That you could not, you know, ha go meet a potential end user uh, or offer any type of solution without talking about data and how it's going to be used and the benefits and things like that. So became part of the, da the daily di yeah, dialogue. Exactly. So, you know, another area, you know, we talk about some of these, the, the business side of the business, which we just talked about from the technology side of the business. Um, you know, one of the, the things that we saw, at least I saw, and I think you guys agree and many of the audience will, is the move to the edge. And, you know, uh, greater computing power 
uh, for less money and being able to process and do things at that device level, at that edge level, truly started to come of its own in 2018. And, um, yeah, I want to hop in there, Mark, because yeah. you're, you're right. And, uh, that was 2018 was it. And of course, LinkSpring, the company you work with, uh, is one of the pioneers. You're one of the first people to come out with an edge controller. So for our audience who might not know what makes a controller an edge controller. At the end of the day is being able to connect, uh, at that edge, at the source, at that device level, uh, gain access to the data. And in many cases, you can push it up to a cloud environment if you want to, or process that data right there at that device level, and then do command and control based on the data processing or the analytics and things like that. And again, it, there's you know there's a lot of pros for that that you don't have to you're not clogging up a network. You know you can do it uh, faster. Uh, more accurate in real time and so forth and so on. And again, the computer technology and the applications now have allowed us to really do that. And just to plug into 2019, I see more and more of that uh, becoming mainstay in our industry. And that's going to become the norm versus the exception. Right. Well, well, the other thing we heard all year was the having the IP controllers. Mm -hmm. So speak about IP controllers and, and what's the difference between an IP controller and a regular controller and how do you see that shaking out as we go forward? I'd like both your guys' opinions on that. Go ahead, Kenny. Certainly, the, the IP controller, uh, the, to me, uh, we started seeing it in specifications. So the first guys to get it uh, took an opportunity. And basically, it's just data. You know, it's, it's about bandwidth. It's about getting more uh, more information flowing through you know, what you have it, uh, and, and, and some of the, the – um, the bottlenecks that were occurring in networks were due to going from MSTP to to the field level you know, devices to the supervisory controllers to the you know the front end and then wherever it was going you know so basically what IP controllers allow you is flexibility on installations and multiple uh, installations in other words you could take IP and, and everything that's uh, you could take an IP you know power over Ethernet camera now uh, to an IP controller and take it right where you want it to and then have another network coming in for uh, you know, communications. So it's it's flexibility and, and it's powerful data. Um, and then uh, I want to revisit the, the the next thing. But Mark, uh, again, the, the edge controller explanation is great. What's your version of the uh, IP controller? What what benefits does that bring versus the uh, the older controller styles? Well, again, I just think the whole fact that it's IP based. I'm sorry. That the yeah. fact that it yeah that it is IP based. And um, that everything today is has moved or is moving to IP. And again, it just offers that flexibility and the power that IP actually brings. And um, so, um, you know, I think the world, you know, we are heading, we're living in an IP world environment. So what is that going to do for protocols like BACnet and LAN and things like that? Uh, I think they are uh, well suited for that. And, you know, as they continually advance, uh, you know, there will be new standards and new working groups and so forth, which there already are, uh, for making those uh, our traditional protocols uh, IP enabled, so to speak, um, and work and be flexible in the IP environment. All right. Well, so Mark with all and Kenny, with all these sort of new technologies and, you know, the need for data and the, the owners being more educated, it seems like one of the things that's happening is, is, you know, the term master systems integrator, we're hearing a lot more of that, but now we're hearing degrees to master systems integrators. It's like they're different levels. Speak about how you guys have seen the concept of master integration or master integrators change in 2018. Well, uh, I, uh, we've seen it change, at least I've seen it change drastically. And again, uh, I, I hear it, it's part of the daily conversation now, talking about master system integrators and master system integration and what it actually means. And just uh, about two months ago, ourselves, uh, LinkSpring, 
along with Intelligent Buildings, uh, Annexter Sky Foundry, and uh, Navigant Research, uh, did a survey research project on the very subject of master system integrators. And it was interesting to, you know, talk about um, and listen to our, our view some of the information that got out of it. And what really kind of stood out for me is the vast amount of areas in which the master system integrator needs to have domain knowledge and people, uh, not only controls, which you, you would expect in HVAC, but physical security, the network, uh, cyber security, um, video, CCTV, and so forth and so on. And that's what building owners and operators expect from a master system integrator, that they truly are a master of all these different domains in the operational side of a building. Well said, Marcus. Kenny, you have anything to add to that? Yeah, well, I completely agree. Uh, we because we, we, you see the transition where there were those domain experts, and, and Marks, you, you named you know several of them. But <clears throat> at one point in time, they were individually recognized within a specification, and and you know it was economics. You know, if you were working with a, you know a certain uh, lighting company for this many years, and you were working with uh, IT uh, doing your networks, which is was a different company, they were all were kind of uh, isolated in their own uh, you know areas of expertise, their own domains. And then we see the master systems integrator that takes on a role where, you know, in-house they've got the staff capability that uh, the parallels are, are, you know, over uh, exceeds the branches. I mean, I, I was visiting a master systems integrator and I was, I was just overwhelmed how big the, the overhead was. He said they had like, uh, I think 14 certified N4 AX technicians uh, they had uh, their own graphics department, their own their own uh, CAD department. I mean, they had uh, greater capabilities in the branch I had just visited. So I, 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 we're seeing a, a transition. We're seeing the center of the locus of control where the people that used to control the message, the vendors used to, you know, it's shifted from vendors and, and manufacturers to other people in the industry. And one of those uh, partners would be the master systems integrator, but also distributors. We've seen the rise of distributors uh, that have become the compelling voices in our industry, and have shifted uh, the attentions and and the way thing the way business has been done for so many years, uh, where you have you know uh, people having national accounts now. You, you take you look at some of the, the large uh, you know integration distributors like Control Co, like Cochrane, like Stromquist, and they have change the viewpoint of the user that instead of relying on, on the particular branch, now they go to the distributor and this distributor becomes their trusted agent, their trusted advisor who normally is going to connect them to a master systems integrator that they've vetted and trust, you know, ultimately. Uh, and the accountability uh, that you had mentioned previously, Marcus, was that now they want one throat to choke. So there's a role now of this, this, this master systems integrator that becomes the GC of integration. So they then become the police police force or the police agency that makes sure that nobody slips in a disparate system. They make darn certain that the lights and the access control and everything in that building, elevators, escalators, whatever it might be, has a uh, protocol that can be easily, uh, you know, integrated into whatever the central mix uh, building. Uh, yeah, yeah, it makes, so, a, makes a lot of sense, Kenny. My question then would be, oh, do you have, I'm sorry, you, go on. Yeah. So, so I, I'll throw this out to you two. So this role of a master system integrator, should a guaranteed SLA be part of the conversation between building owner operator and a master system integrator or uptime for systems, uh, response time, so forth and so on, whatever, you know, whatever you might well, the want. The SLA, what, what, is that a service liability agreement? What, what is an SLA again? Uh, Just more of a guarantee that, you know, we guaranteeing that you're uh, absolutely 99.9% of the time or this, that, and the other. And because uh, I, I, at the end of the day, I think it should be part of the conversation. It should be part of that. That's one of the things that I think master system integrators can help ensure and guarantee for the most part, you know, so what do you guys think? 
Oh, I, I wouldn't touch that with a 20 right. foot pole. We got too many. Well, I, I see it happening, Mark. You, 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 some of you mentioned too, uh, uh, that, you know, you can see more things as a service being provided. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we, Eric and I have had several exploratory uh, conversations with people from neighboring industry and <laughs> channel experts that say our building automation industry is running a parallel to uh, previous industries integration. Uh, I, uh, you know, it, it, and that was basically the IT uh, where you had the people that provided the services could not get close enough to the end users to get their business. So they performed these, these, these partnerships. And, and so the, this particular person we interviewed said that we need to make friends with people in lateral capabilities so that we, we do have somebody IT on our, our, on our side knows how to handle networks so that we can become part of the managed service wave. That's going to eventually have its way in our industry. And, and, we had been to several uh, meetings, national meetings, where they said that the managed services are on the rise. That uh, you know, one day, unfortunately, the number of components being sold for a project, you know, particularly building automation, is is reducing. The arc, the you know, the architecture and the you know, the diagram, ladder diagram is going from maybe five five levels to two levels, mm -hmm. maybe one, because we've seen the IP controllers come in now. So what are you going to do? You're going to get into managed services. You're going to get into doing this, like you said. You're going to either have somebody on staff or you're going to have a, a trusted partner, business partner, that together you provide a portfolio of services that would be, uh, to your point too, nobody has a million dollars or half a million dollars anymore to – buy this thing overnight. So you're going to see people provide these services where you're going to pay 5000 or $7,000 a month because they can't afford that. And eventually it's up to us to solve how we can provide the immediate delivery of the services and then ensure we recoup, uh, you know, over time our investments. So it's, it's, a, it's a tremendous opportunity, but it's a tremendous well challenge. Said, Kenny. Well said. Well, guys, let's shift gears a little bit because, Mark, you know, you have were one of the early pioneers in terms of tracking cybersecurity, creating cyber awareness. <clears throat> what have you seen in 2018 and what do you see looking out into 2019 vis-a-vis -vis cybersecurity? Um, interesting. I think the cyber threats can continue to grow and they are more sophisticated and deadly with each passing year. That said, I believe that 2019 is the year of truth for cybersecurity. I think generally, as an industry, while many have embraced the importance of cybersecurity and doing things, uh, we're still falling short. Uh, and I think uh, 2019, we can't afford to fall short anymore. Uh, one of the interesting things that uh, it's crossed my desk recently is the um, in California. Uh, they passed a new law, and I'm going to read this. Uh, it's a new law that goes into effect that any smart device sold in California, including consumer and enterprise tools, starting January 1, 2020, manufacturers will have to include reasonable security features to protect stored or transmitted information from unauthorized access, destruction, use, modification, or disclosure. Wow. So that, to me, is telling right there. Uh, if, you know, obviously California has always been a state that, uh, you know, starts a lot of trends and things. And, you know, I wouldn't be surprised as more and more states do this. But as an industry, we talk about it. There's plenty of information out there. There's plenty of things to do to help ensure cybersecurity, but I think we still have a long way to truly embrace uh, what we need to be doing collectively as an industry. I agree. And I think the reason why is that the, it's a carrot and the rod. Uh, not many people are interested in you know, taking on the liability or you know, assuming the liability if they can't make a, you know, a profit and can't pay for it. And, and you can't make it uh, you know, a, a, a revenue a source until you are a master at it and provide services uh, that commensurate to a fee or a charge. So under those managed services, you're going to have to get, uh, you know, you have to rely on somebody out there that is an expert. And we've seen a rise. Yeah, and to your credit, uh, Mark, you, you, you and uh, Fred Gordy were our first recognized control trend cybersecurity um, 
hero, so to speak, because nobody knew what was going on. I mean, it was like a hot potato. Uh, you know, now finally we're seeing that there's a uh, traveler agency, for instance, has a, has a nice rider that you can add to your, uh, your insurance policy that provides specific cybersecurity insurance. Um, and, you know, California does lead the way. And, and you know, I'm kind of glad to hear it uh, because there's – directions that people need to have. I mean, if you know you got a problem and, and you don't know how to solve it, then you've got two problems. If you got a problem and you know how to solve it, then that problem's less and then you can take, uh, you know, uh, progressive steps to achieve uh, a certain level of cybersecurity. We have heard, uh, you know, it's too early to release it, but we were uh, privileged to hear that there's going to be um, a very serious uh, dashboard being a uh, added to uh, software in the future that is going to give you indications of your cybersecurity health on your network. Uh, we've seen people like Optergy take a, a you know a device that was designed to monitor the health of your back uh, Optigo, network. Kenny. I think it's Optigo, right? Oh uh, uh, yeah, Optigo. Where is it Optigy? That's right. I'm sorry. Yes, yes, Optigo. Uh, uh, Optigy. I'm sorry, Optigo. Sorry. Uh, what's his name? Ping. He's going to be mad at me. So, sorry. No, uh, you can always edit that if you want. But, uh, okay, so Optigo, for instance, uh, came up with a very clever uh, iteration of something that was designed to do back net health monitoring of the network. So, if you take on a project, you can do a scan of the network and say, hey, you're at 48%. So, when I put my stuff on here, uh, it didn't go, but it did diminish your health of your network. In fact, we improved it to 68%. But they now took that and they can they can determine anomaly uh, activity uh, and behavior of your network where if something, something that shouldn't be getting all this activity all of a sudden does, uh, then you know somebody uh, is, 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 is having its way with your network and serving as a, you know, uh, a conduit for uh, you know, activities that aren't – they so weren't more, designed. More so more indi indicators are be. Be coming out. So, so you think that's a trend we're going to see going forward, guys? That, yeah. Absolutely, and we need it. And so I think, uh, Mark, to your point, we, we have been – very slow to adopt realistic cybersecurity measures uh, individually, uh, organizationally, and professionally. So, uh, and, and, and if there's going to be consequences if you don't. So, it's going to be a good one. It's good. I just I'd like to know what products are available because Eric, you and I uh, are in the business of selling services and, and and widgets and components. What I hope we can do is sell, you know, almost like the software licensing agreements. Let's sell a soft a cybersecurity license, uh, you know, uh, whatever. So it becomes part of a uh, of a packaged, integrated uh, solution. Well, real quick, guys, is there anybody that is doing a very specific cybersecurity training that you guys are aware of that our integrators and distributors could take advantage of? Well, the Linkspring uh, has one, don't they? Uh, no, uh, we don't. Um, unfortunately. Um, I think NIST probably has some. There's a couple others that uh, I, I can't think of on the top of my head that I know uh, that there is information, you know, available or whatever. So I'll get that to you and you can post it. Uh, they, yeah, they're, they are definitely out there. And, uh, and, you know, something that, you know, when we first started talking about cybersecurity back in 2012, uh, end of 12, um, you know, one of the things that, you know, I thought was very important was it's a shared responsibility. So what does that mean? It's the manufacturer's responsibility. It is the integrator. It is the distributor. And it's the building owner's responsibility to ask and demand, what are we going to do with respect to helping secure uh, this building operational network, if you will, and manufacturers obviously build it into their products and solutions, distributors, you know, and integrators offer it, no, you know, so forth and so on. And I don't think that's changed. It's a, a absolutely a shared response. Very cool. Couldn't, couldn't agree more. All right, boys and girls, we're going to transition from 2018 to 2019. The first big event of 2019 happens in Atlanta on Sunday January 13th. Mark, can you tell our audience what that is? I, I have no clue. What are you talking about? <laughs> uh, Super Bowl? No. Of course, it's the Super Bowl of, of the building automation and control industry. Uh, it's getting started on this one. We have uh, probably, again, we say it every year, but I think this year, the, the way things have lined up 
over time, uh, you know, things come together. It's one of these like composite things. You start out and, and you get the, uh, the location. And, and we're delighted that we've got the Fox Theater. It is a, an amazing facility. They give tours to it just for historic purposes. Uh, it reminds you of one of those speakeasy uh, environments where it was built uh, for the, the height of economic you know, uh, enjoyment. Uh, it's just it's a lavish facility that the Fox Theater, the Fox uh, people, Fox, uh, the, the, the Hollywood Fox bought 20 of these facilities and converted them to Fox Theaters across the country. Now there's only three remaining, and we're going to have the 2018 Control Trends Awards uh, January 13th from 6.30 to 9.30 at the Fox Theater at Atlanta, in Atlanta. And this place is just, a, it's, a, it's an amazing facility. It's just, it has that ambience that we always strive to get that Hollywood type thing. Uh, you feel like you're going into a very special environment just by going through the portal of the door. You see these historic pictures. Uh, and then we have this uh, Egyptian ballroom that uh, they just, uh, the way I understand it, they invested $8 million to refurbish this, this, yeah, uh, just for this just for our event, but, but and and they knew the control cards yeah. were coming, and you know, so <laughs> that we're going to have our party in there, and it's it's going to be a banquet style thing again. You know, it's going to be um, it's a pre event thing. Uh, EJIO has their VIP event, but you, have, but you have, have to reach out to them to get an invitation to go to that. You can't just show up for that this year, right? And and then from there, uh, we're going to go into the. Um, the main ballroom area. We're going to have uh, some surprises, some entertainment, uh, and you know, uh, just a, a tremendous but, show. But, but, because but we've got no, you, you're right about that. But you, I mean, the venue and all the stuff you just said pales. I mean, absolutely pales in comparison to our MC. Can you tell us about the MC we have this year? Oh well, I mean, we've got a dynamic duo that's uh, unbeatable. We have uh, a guy who's the industry stalwart, and 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 he brings some showmanship and, and and entertainment to the stage, and he's assisted by a co MC that brings grace and and elegance to the stage, along with knowledge. And together, Mark Peacock and Kim Brown are the top NC MCs of of the well, industry. Well, they, they so, are, uh, yeah. Oh, and there's Mark yeah, right yeah. there. Mark. Oh wow! I shoot, man, you guys. Mark, I tell Mark, you, just so you, you know, know that uh, stalwart. And uh, German and Swedish means stud. So he called you an industry star. Oh, I, got <laughs> it. I got it. Got it. You know, you know, we talk about the awards. You know, one of the things that I, uh, I I'm finding this uh, interest interesting this this year is that we have a lot of new categories that we did not have previously, and uh, so it's going to be interesting to see. Uh, you know who are the recognized uh, uh, winners uh, uh, of these categories. And I think that's one of the unique things too about the Control Trend Awards is that there's always going to be the stalwart of uh, awards, you know, thermostats and automation control, control of the year and so forth. But as our industry changes, there's always new categories and new and some categories that uh, go by the wayside. So uh, that's what I'm going to find extremely interesting. We have a lot of new categories. Well, a lot of new people got nominated from, you know, the yes. Silicon Valley, you know, industry, you know, adjacent industries really got a lot of support. So we might have some surprise winners this year. It's, it's probably not going to be just the same group of usual suspects. So it's going to be exciting. Um, the other, yeah, I was going to say the other thing too about the venue when I know when the three of us went and visited it, and um, just walking the halls and seeing the photographs of the performers and people who have graced their presence in the stage there at the theater, you just, you're in awe of seeing from politicians to entertainers to musicians to movie stars to uh, industry giants and so forth and so on. And if those walls could speak, I'm just, it would just be amazing to hear. Well, what they and it'd probably to be X rated too with some of the, yeah, but, but probably. Yeah. Oh <laughs> I don't know about <laughs> that. Hey, guys. Um, well, and also, uh, and Mark, to your point uh, about the, the, the show itself, again, <clears throat> and we're delighted that not only that there's been a, a uh, kind of a, uh, a control trend, you know, we, we monitor the trends and, and some of the items that were of very important, of, of importance 
say three, four, five years ago, no longer rise up to bubble up to become the trends and, and the important products and solutions uh, to your point that are now fixated. Like, in, and one of them is the IoT thing and how uh, you have a, a Raspberry Pi controller popping up next to, uh, you know, one of the, the uh, you know, venerated manufacturers controllers, you know, so it shows clearly that there's been a shift of interest and a shift of economic interest into different styles of performing the same thing. That is providing comfort. Uh, there's been an, a, a huge awareness, huge growth in, in actually determining what is, what, what, what do people need to be comfortable? How do they feel uh, part of the, you know, the ambience of the building so that they, they feel integrated and they perform at their, the best of their, their capabilities and, uh, you know, how people, uh, you know, how these owners are trying to reduce, you know, absenteeism, you know, uh, you know, uh, reasons for people to call in sick. Uh, I remember back when they first started coming out with CO2 monitoring uh, and the sick building syndrome, how we sold those things like toilet paper because bank employees, everybody thought they were in a building that was sick, you know, and, and you had to prove to them that you've got fresh air uh, and that the, the, the levels uh, of, of car, CO2, and then you talk about schools and, and the ventilation requirements, you know, the ASHRAE uh, imposes, uh, you know, you have to prove that you're providing this now and it just keeps getting more uh, you know extreme uh, another thing about the control trends awards that is just absolutely delightful is the participation from around the world we we now uh, have you know 53 countries have, have have voted in the control trends and so the globality of the control trends is is for real and and it's something that eric and i uh, you know constantly try to uh, you know deal with because you know there's there's certain uh, persuasions or certain products that are isolated to this part of the world, and some of them are, are global in nature, and, they, and they're the same product, uh, you know, all all the countries. And so it's an amazing industry, and I think that achieves this. Is what I'm getting at is that one of the primary reasons uh, that we started at the, in the beginning of the conversation here uh, to the show was why is the control trends important, and why why is it successful, why is it growing? It is because People understand now that we have a heck of an industry. It, we speak the same language around the world, and that is buildings and, and comfort. Uh, you know, and, and so it doesn't matter. Re, Eric and I have been around the world with the, you know, the different meetings or whatever, and everywhere we go, it's the same uh, challenge. It's the same opportunity. And some of these buildings are 1,000 years old, 500 years old, 200 years old, and, and a year old. And, and yet you know, each building poses its own set of challenges and we sell the products and solutions that solve those and the people that do this from the contractors to the distributors to the vendors uh, get to come and hang out one night and recognize each other in the same room and say wow so that's I finally met Mark Petar that's what he looks like that's that's more well said right. well said so, Kenny well listen before so, Kenny well listen before we wrap it up Mark um, final question for you is what do you think the biggest trend we're going to see in 2019 will be um I, I, you know, it's hard to try to just put one. I'm going to say choice. And there, the, um, the uh, availability of choice from solutions, applications, and so forth and so on, I think uh, probably is going to be the biggest trend driving everything, whether, and that's going to all drive whether, the edge, the platforms, the software as a service model, to so forth and so on. So I would okay, say so choice. Kenny, I'm going to use a vocab word here for you, buddy. So Mark, is uh -oh. that a harbinger of things to come from Link Spring in 2019? Can you expand upon that comment? Uh, I'm going to be, you know, I'm in Washington, D.C. I'm going to say... <laughs> Mr. Peacock has no comment oh, at this time. Wonderful, wonderful. Okay, guys. <laughs> I can neither confirm nor deny. No, right, the right. The there you go, uh, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. Thank yeah. you so much for tuning in. You've been listening to Control Talk Now, the Smart Buildings video cast and podcast. Our guest this week has been Mark Peacock from Link Spring and also the MC of the Control Trends Awards. And of course, from the man, the myth, the legend, and myself, we appreciate your support over the year of 2018. Looking forward to a great 2019. So remember, be bold, stay in control, and stay relevant. Indeed, Eric. Indeed, Kenny and Mark. And that's a wrap. All right. All right.